I'm going to give my um, contribution towards the series that Pastor Frank has been preaching on, Just Believe, and my contribution is Just Believe the Whole Truth. And um, a long time ago, Bob Dylan sang, The Times They Are A-Changing, and he was right then, and I think he's still right today. And the older I get, the more changes I see. Also, the, the older I get, the more drastic those changes seem to get. And here's a couple of examples. We have the generation gap there. We have, um, and Pastor Frank and I are actually modelling this next one with our knees. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, we have the tattoos. There's one change in particular that I want to examine today, and it's the increasing trend towards instant gratification. I looked up the definition, and it says, instant or immediate gratification is a term that refers to the temptation and resulting tendency to forego a future benefit in order to obtain a less rewarding but more immediate benefit. But then I came across an easier definition, which is, I want it now. There seems to be more and more emphasis these days on the need for us to get what we want now. Let me give you just two illustrations. First of all, money. When I was a boy, there was no credit cards. If people wanted to, to buy something, they had to save first. When I was 12 years old, I got a job sweeping classrooms after school, and it took me a few months, and I saved up enough money to buy my first major purchase, which at that time was a cricket bat. It was awesome. And that's the way things were bought back then. Loans were very rare. They were only used for the very largest items like houses or cars. For other items, saving was the only way. And not only did people save up for whatever was needed, they also tended to put money away in case of emergencies. I remember when Connie and I moved into a house in Frankston back in 1985, my parents came from South Australia to visit. And my father, who was incredibly conservative, looked me in the eye and he said, make sure, son, you, that you always have $1,000 at least in the bank, which was a fair bit of money back in those days. And I, not to his face, but quietly to myself, I, I laughed because I'd never had that much money ever in the bank. Why was there such a difference between his attitude and mine? because attitudes towards finance had changed. I was in the generation that invented the credit card because we needed to have what we wanted now. Why wait to save up enough money for something when we could buy it now and pay it off? And the change in finances can also be seen at a national level. John Howard was Australia's Prime Minister from 1996 until 2007. For that entire period, his treasurer was Peter Costello, and he presided over 10 years running of budget surpluses. That means for 10 years running, we as a nation planned to take in more money than we intended to spend. Doesn't sound like rocket science, does it? It's <laughs> pretty much what any sensible person or household would do. However, for the past 13 years as a nation, we have planned each year to spend more than we earn. Due to the COVID crisis last year, that's gotten a whole lot worse because we want the government to stimulate the economy during and after shutdowns. We are far more concerned with our immediate needs than being worried about money that we don't yet have. It's a clear case of instant gratification. The second example, that also points to our obsession with instant gratification is our attitude towards sex. Before the sexual revolutions of the late 50s and 60s, the general consensus was that the proper place for sex was inside a marriage between a man and a woman, usually for life. Sex outside of marriage was frowned upon, and we actually had terrible names for it, like fornication and adultery. Girls tended to guard their virginity so that they could look forward to the day when they would proudly wear white as they walked down the aisle as brides. 
Babies born outside of wedlock were rare and the practice was definitely frowned upon. But then, as the need for instant gratification increased, we decided as a society to take sex out of the bounds of marriage and it became commonplace for couples to sleep with each other while dating. More and more couples decided to live together before marrying. Babies born out of wedlock became commonplace and other kinds of sexual behaviour that had previously been considered perverse and even illegal now became commonplace. Fast forward today, and the odd ones out are those of us who hold to old-fashioned views on sex. Nowadays, anyone who believes that sex should be reserved only for married couples is considered very weird. And all these drastic changes have come about because of instant gratification because we feel the need to satisfy our sexual appetites now. What about the church? Has that growing trend of instant gratification also been evident in the church? Well, my experience would suggest that it has. When I became a Christian in the early 1980s, things were a lot different to what we experience now. I remember the first midweek prayer meeting I attended. The people there were old timers who'd been in the church for many years. And when they prayed, they were very solemn. And to be honest, their prayers were rather depressing. It seemed to be all about telling God about their hardships and, and asking God to help them endure should the Lord tarry. And that word means wait. In other words, their outlook on life was to hang tough, to batten down the hatches, wait out the hardships and look to the second coming of Jesus when rel relief would finally come. Some of you older Christians might remember the way certain people witnessed for Jesus back then with sandwich boards saying, repent for the end is nigh. Anybody remember those? <laughs> no? Their message was all about the distant future. A song by Louis Armstrong based on an old African-American spiritual song from the slavery days pretty much sums up the focus at that time. Some of the lyrics go like this. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Glory, hallelujah. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down. Oh, yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost to the ground. Oh, yes, Lord. If I get there before, if you get there before I do. Oh, yes, Lord. Tell all my friends I'm coming, coming to. Oh, yes, Lord. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows but Jesus. But as so often happens, the changing views in society found their way into the church. The trend towards instant gratification also began to find expression in the church. People began to look for God's blessings closer to home and the prosperity doctrine arrived with a bang. Instead of focusing on the second coming of Jesus to end all our current troubles, the focus shifted now to Jesus wanting to, be us, to, to bless us right here, right now. There was a popular movie at the end of the 1980s called Dead Poet Society with Robin Williams as a professor teaching his pupils to make the most of every moment. The catch cry in that movie was carpe diem, which means seize the day. In other words, stop worrying about the future. And in recent times, the church see it certainly seems to have done that. Let me give you just one example. The largest church in the United States of America is Lakewood Church in Houston, Texas with a weekly attendance of 43,500. They would have trouble social distancing in here. <laughs> the pastor, Joel Osteen, is known for his sermons on how we can be the best that we can be right now. In fact, one of his best-selling books has the title, Your Best Life Now, Seven Steps to Living at Your Full Potential. One of the ads for that book says, In Your Best Life Now, Austin says, I am what I am today because of what I believed about myself yesterday and I will be tomorrow what I'm believing about myself right now. So the focus on getting what we want here and now is certainly alive and well, both in society and in the church, which begs the question, is that a good or bad thing? I personally don't believe that focusing on getting God's blessings now is in itself a bad thing. For almost 40 years, I've experienced God's blessings on a daily basis. 
And I'm very glad that I'm not just hanging in there until Jesus comes again. But I have begun to wonder whether we might be losing perspective just a little. Even though it's not good to be focused only on the future all the time, it also might be a big mistake to lose sight of what's ahead. The Apostle Paul makes a compelling argument in his letter to the Romans, not just for the church, but for society. For society, one thing their changing views have completely neglected is God's involvement. In earlier times, people in our Western society might not all have been Christians, but people's general views and morals had their foundation on Christian principles. The Ten Commandments and Jesus' teachings formed the basis of our modern Western civilization's sense of morality. Now that's changed. So much so, in fact, that our society seems to be moving towards a total abstinence of God. Now, Paul must have faced this kind of godlessness when he wrote to the Romans. Interestingly, he described people's godlessness not in terms of ignorance, but wickedness. And he says that wickedness brings about God's anger. Romans 1.18 The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Paul's suggesting that ignorance about God is not because God is difficult to find. Quite the opposite. It's because people deliberately prefer to avoid him because if they did, they might have to reconsider their bad behaviour. Do you think that Paul's right, that God's invisible qualities can be clearly seen in our world if we only choose to look? I think he is, and for good reason. Firstly, we all seem to have a sense of right or wrong. Where did that come from? If you suddenly saw me kicking a dog, you would think straight away, that's not very nice. Why, is, why isn't it very nice? If there's no God, if there's no instigator of moral right or wrong, why is it wrong? Without God, isn't life just a matter of survival of the fittest? The whole concept of morality points to a moral creator. Secondly, we can all see the intricate design in creation. The magnificent design of our whole creation points to a divine designer. I've often thought that it takes far more faith to believe that this carefully, wonderfully designed creation is an accident and came out of nothing than it is to believe in a divine creator. The person who drew this cartoon feels the same way. And Paul's argument continues. People are without excuse when they choose to turn away from God. And in response, God gives them what they think they want. He gives them over to their desires, lusts and depraved thinking with horrific results. Listen, Romans 1.28. Just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. That was written in the first century. Yet I think you'd agree that it describes our society pretty well today because we're becoming a godless society. If we took each of those descriptions that Paul mentions there and checked to see whether it's getting better or worse, I'm pretty sure we'd know which direction it's heading in. Just a quick scroll through social media would give you a real big clue. Why is it happening? Simply because we're turning away from God. The bad news this morning is that that's not all God does in response to our turning away from him. Paul goes on to speak about a coming judgment by God's people, uh, a coming judgment on God's people because of their sins. 
Because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against your day, yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. So first, Paul's, uh, God's first reaction to our sins is to just give us over to face the natural consequences. Godless behaviour always comes with adverse consequences. But there is also a day of God's wrath coming. And here's the surprising part. Are you ready? Drum roll. Believe it or not, that day of judgment is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 2.16. This will take place on the day when my God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. For years and years now, preaching of the gospel has generally only focused on the first coming of Jesus Christ when he came to pay the price for our sins. But according to Paul here, the gospel is more than that. It's also about the second coming of Jesus to judge people's sins. If we're serious about the Christian gospel, we've got to concern ourselves not just with Jesus' first coming, but his second coming as well. Not just Jesus as saviour, but also Jesus as judge. We must not be spiritually short-sighted looking just at today. We must avoid the pitfalls of instant gratification. So let's have a quick look at why it's important for us to look beyond what Jesus can do for us right now. The second coming of Christ is mentioned more than 300 times in the New Testament. There are eight times more verses concerning his second coming than there are concerning his first. There are whole chapters such as Matthew chapters 24 and 25, Mark 13, Luke 21 and 1 Corinthians 15 that are devoted to the second coming. Entire books, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, Revelation, are given over to this subject. About 50 times in the New Testament, believers are urged to be ready for when the Lord comes again. Why? The Apostle Paul describes in a very simple way in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In other words, each and every day was precious to him, as an opportunity to live for Christ here and now, but going to be with Christ would be the ultimate blessing. Paul had a great balance in seeing what could be gained today as well as looking to what was to come. And what was to come helped him enormously in getting the best out of today. And he gave these great analogies in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified from the prize." Paul's focus was on the prize that awaited him at Christ's return. It motivated him in the way that he lived each and every day. He was strict in doing everything to ensure that prize would not be forfeited. In other words, his sight was set on the finish line. In his other writings, he gave insights into how such an approach benefits us here and now. Firstly, looking to the second coming of Christ helps us to live in the light today. Romans 13 the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Paul knew that Christ had saved him from his sins. But he also understood that the full realisation of salvation, an end to the struggles here and now, would only come when Jesus returned. So he determined to live accordingly now, to live in the light each and every day, to avoid the deeds of darkness at all costs. Secondly, Paul pointed out that a long-term view focused on Christ's return helps us to navigate life's unfairness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. The painful truth is that we live in an unfair world. 
I, I feel passionate about this because I see more and more in the media, even in schools, I see kids being taught about equity. Everybody has to have the same results. Life has to be fair. Well, the truth is that life is not fair. Connie came from a, a, an upbringing where life was very unfair and so when our children were small, she would make sure that everything was fair between the three of them. It had to be t totally fair. And I would look and I'd say, they've got to learn life's not fair. <laughs> Evil often triumphs. God, good often fails to be rewarded. The sufferings of Christ are a perfect example, as are the examples of persecuted Christians throughout history. Paul points out that justice will be done. The troublers will be dealt with. The troubled will find relief. Jesus, when he comes again, will bring about perfect justice. And that's a truth to comfort us right here, right now, and get us through the tough times. Paul also explained how the second coming of Christ can help us through times of grief. 1 Thessalonians 4, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Consider this morning's communion message from Pastor Frank. The second coming of Christ provides incredible encouragement to any believer who's lost loved ones. Jesus was the first to be raised from the dead and all those who put their faith in him will follow his example. The second coming of Christ will bring about the biggest reconciliation of loved ones you could ever imagine. Nobody really knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. It might have been Paul, it might have been somebody else. Whoever it was, they also saw other benefits coming today for looking to the return of Christ. Hebrews 10, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. As we look to the return of Christ coming closer each and every day, we have something in common with every other believer. We can encourage one another with that promise. We can spur one another on to greater acts of love for Jesus and each other right now. And we can enjoy ongoing and increasing fellowship with each other right now. The promise of Christ's return can keep us together better right now, if we main focus on him. Now, those are all relevant and important reasons for not limiting ourselves only to instant gratification for balancing the needs to enjoy today with the need to look to the future. Looking to Christ's return actually helps us to live better today. But to be perfectly honest with you, I want to look ahead to Christ's return for reasons that are even more important to me. Firstly, when Jesus comes again, there will finally be an end to all of this world's sorrow and sickness. Revelation 21, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. No matter how much instant gratification we might enjoy now, sorrow, sickness, mourning, death, disease, pain will always still be with us until Jesus comes and then total relief will come and I can't wait. Secondly, the second coming of Jesus will usher in the end of Satan. Revelation 20, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. And then after that short time, and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Because Jesus is coming again, not only will we finally and forever be free of Satan's deceptions, temptations and torments, but we will see God's justice completely done once and for all. No more Satan. No more temptation. 
That'll be awesome. But even more, it'll be an end to the sin in which we were all born and with which we constantly struggle. That sin causes us to be separated from our wonderful, loving creator so that we live not according to God's righteous reign, but rather according to our carnal, sinful nature, which also makes us susceptible to the devil's temptations and lies and the influence of his wicked world system. First John says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, sinless, for we shall see him as he is. Jesus has already dealt with sins by dying on the cross to pay the punishment that we deserve. He took our place, and as a result, all those who put their faith in him are made righteous. God sees us right now as righteous as Jesus is himself. And so he's able, once again, to have fellowship with us. He adopts us as his very own children. But that's not the end of the matter. Even as believers, we need to deal with our sinful natures constantly. That's why Jesus told us that we have to die to ourselves daily. Presently, ours are lives of constantly coming to Jesus in faith, repenting of our sins and receiving his complete forgiveness. The Apostle John, writing to Christians, says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. When you stop and think about that, that is awesome. Like, I've, I've committed a sin. I shouted at Connie, Lord, forgive me for shouting at Connie. Son, I forgive you. And while I'm at it, I'm going to clean you of every other sin. Whoa. <laughs> One day we're going to find out just what sins we've been cleansed of and we're going to be horrified and gratified. <laughs> but, you know, there's an even better day coming. Revelation 22, no longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will see him, serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Jesus is coming back to make everything right. No more sorrow, sickness, Satan and importantly, no more sin. No more darkness, no more separation from God, no more curse, no more condemnation, no more guilt, no more shame. Just glorious union with our wonderful God, enjoying the sinless, magnificent life that he's always intended for his people. I started out talking about the increasing trend toward instant gratification, getting what we want now regardless of the future. I firmly believe that there are amazing blessings that God has for us right here, right now, each and every day. And I hope we're all inspired to enjoy today because of Jesus. But I also hope I've convinced us all that there's so much more to come. We must not neglect looking beyond today to the glorious finale that God has prepared. Our gospel must not be limited. Yes, it is certainly all about the redemption by Jesus at Calvary, but it doesn't stop there. There is so much more to look forward to. Jesus is coming again with even more amazing gifts and rewards, as well as punishments for those who refuse to believe. We must therefore do as the Christian church has done throughout its history, look to the blessed hope of, our return, of the return of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We must commit to just believing the whole truth. Amen.